Hello, video games rhetoric class. I'm Bill Sleese. Welcome to my home office. Um, thank you for having uh, me as a guest today. A little about myself. Uh, I teach in the SSGA program here at Embry-Riddle Prescott. This is my fifth year, I think. In addition <clears throat> to our game design course, I teach our programming classes, including AI, uh, game engine architecture, full stack development. Um, I've taught our VR class and our simulation classes. Uh, prior to that, <clears throat> I spent a dozen or so years working in the video game industry. The first game I worked on was at Cyan. It was a real-time version of Myst, M-Y-S-T. Myst came out in the mid-1990s. I joined Cyan in 1999 and was there through 2005, uh, so not long after the original. Uh, Myst was the best-selling PC game of all time for about 10 years, and it's uh, now featured in a Smithsonian exhibit. So it's a national treasure, <laughs> and I got to work on a couple of different versions of it and a few sequels. My heart and uh, most of my time was in the MMO version, massively multiplayer online version. It was called Uru back then, U-R-U, uh, and it's still alive. It's being kept alive by the players and fans. Uh, if you Google Mist Online, you'll find it. <clears throat> so I've done a little bit of thinking about games and storytelling over the years, and uh, I'm delighted to share some of that with you today. So these are my current thoughts and opinions. Um, I don't pretend to be the authority on these things. The game industry moves fast and uh, surprises are always right around the corner. So it's best to keep an open mind and try to expect the unexpected uh, and stay playful uh, or you'll miss the best stuff. So on the topic of video games and rhetoric, here's uh, where I'm at today. Um, when it comes to storytelling, uh, games, are, honestly, are at a significant disadvantage, I think, compared to other mediums. But there is a particular storytelling mechanism or tool that all, all mediums can employ, but when you use them in games, uh, it's so powerful. I think it makes up for all, all the other shortcomings. Um, so what are those disadvantages? Let's talk about disadvantages first before I reveal, I think, what, um, what their superpower is. Okay, um, this uh, book, it looks, um, it doesn't look academic. I understand that. Um, but we don't want to judge a book by its cover. This book, A Theory of Fun, for game design by Raph Koster. Raph, at the time of the, they wrote this, and this was a while ago, um, Koster, K-O-S-T-E-R, he was the chief creative officer for Sony Online Entertainment. I don't know where he is now. I don't know what he's done since then. But uh, before that, he, uh, he worked as a lead designer, lead, uh, creative lead for Ultima Online. And after that, um, creative director for Star Wars Galaxies and Empire Divided. So those are both massively multiplayer online games. Um, so, and those that was the dawn of this genre. So, um, very knowledgeable guy. And he spoke at GDC for a number of years. He was a thought leader in this space, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and so, one of the interesting things in this book, he talks about um, games as a medium and he compares and contrasts them with uh books and movies right so um so stories he tells us and what he means here is traditional storytelling means uh anything you can imagine it's not it's not video games uh they're you know the the emphasis is on providing a vicarious um, experience. Um, stories help us empathize with uh, other characters and people. Uh, they blur and and deepen our understanding of of what's going on with those characters and the world that they inhabit. Um, and they're about internal. They focus on uh, internal thoughts, emotions. Right. That's their. That's the strength of. Uh, 
books, movies, plays, that sort of thing. We can get inside characters' heads, right? Um, games, on the other hand, <clears throat> the experience is not vicarious, right? Uh, it's Games are much more directly experiential. Um, they also tend to objectify reality. If you want to make a game out of war, for example, maybe you create an 8 by 8 grid and on it you place pieces that you call uh, kings and knights and castles and bishops and queens and they can they have certain ways they can move on the board and when they occupy a space uh, one of them defeats the other so we're objectifying those roles right and the board itself um, games want to quantize and classify different things so we want to categorize it's a very analytical process really and games tend to be about all those external actions moving things building things um uh drawing things what, what else defeating things breaking things um so in fact he goes on to say that you can think of games as action verbs really so um, that's, that's Coster. And so you can see right away that, uh, games at their core, how they function is basically <laughs> the opposite of what we want for stories. And we'd, we'd rather not objectify and quantize and classify and analyze. That's not our, that's not what we think of as storytelling. When we tell a story, we want to empathize. We want to blur and deepen. We want to provide a vicarious experience, right? So... Um, but there's a clue in here as what, uh, to what I think is the superpower of games in terms of storytelling. And it's that experiential part. We're no longer vicarious, right? Um, you're having a direct experience when you play this game. So that was that's Raf Koster. So I wanted to bring him up. The other person I want to point you to is James Paul G. Um, <clears throat> he is now a regent professor at arizona state university um before that he taught at the university of wisconsin uh he was a professor of reading in the department of curriculum and instruction but he's he's a linguist uh um what else so i i saw him originally speak at uh gdc on a panel um, but he has one of his one of his many books, "What Video Games Have to Teach Us About Learning and Literacy." In here, he makes a phenomenal case and provides evidence for the idea that video games are excellent teachers, better teachers than um, <clears throat> a lot of other traditional teaching methods, including teachers themselves in classrooms, traditional classrooms, that kind of thing. Um, and so, I want to highlight just three of the things he talks about here. Uh, <clears throat> the first one is, okay, maybe four, um, three or four, uh, projective identity. That's the first one I want to talk about. <clears throat> Games invite us to inhabit a point of view, right? In a more direct way than, uh, traditional stories do. We can experience a story in a book or a film vicariously. We can watch somebody else thinking and processing the world and doing things in the world and experiencing the consequences and the repercussions of that. And we can see that character grow and change <clears throat> and learn over time. In games, we get to be that character, right? You take on that role yourself. Um, and so with, uh, what he calls projective identity in a game, there are always three identities at play. There's the character you're playing, and then there's the human player who's playing that character, and there's an identity in between those. It's the melding of the player and the character. And so here I'm talking, and he's talking more about role-playing games or any game that has a character, right? We're not talking now about, like, uh, <clears throat> checkers or tic-tac-toe. Um, it turns out that projective identity is uh, crucial to certain kinds of learning. You have to uh, be able to imagine yourself as a role or as something in order for certain kinds of learning to happen. If you can't imagine yourself as a pilot, uh, you're gonna have a hard time 
learning how to be a pilot, um, and uh, etc. So um, that's projective identity. <clears throat> that leads to uh, a notion, another notion he brings up: embodied experiences. Um, games can provide something he calls an embodied experience. It's just the idea that yeah, you are experiencing this directly, even if the world is a fiction and the story you're participating in is a fiction wholly made up, right, and contrived by some designer, um, you are still experiencing that. Um, and those experiences are real. So his example, G's example, are games like Civilization, where an 11-year-old playing a game of Civilization gets to experience, to a certain extent, what it's like to be <clears throat> a ruler of a country, right? All the things that you have to consider and worry about and uh, have anxiety and stress about and what your goals actually are and how to accomplish those goals. Um, you can get that through vicarious experience and story, right? You could read about a character and, and you can learn that way. So we're not saying that other story, other uh, mediums don't do this. We're just saying that games also do this. And potentially, it's it's arguable that since it's an embodied, it's a more direct experience, it's potentially more powerful than a vicarious experience. Potentially, right? So, uh, what's the third thing? Psychosocial moratorium. It's a big couple of words that just means that um, for some types of, of learning to happen or for learning to happen in its um, most effective forms, you need a space where the learner or the person experiencing this thing is free from consequences and can try different things. Um, and G points out that school is not that, right? You get graded on just about everything you do. And I know when my daughter was um, as early as kindergarten, she was being told that if she doesn't do, if she doesn't perform well, <laughs> in this assignment or this scenario, it, she's not going to be able to do well in first grade, you know, and then in first grade and second grade, you're told about third grade and fourth, and then you're told about high school. And if you don't do well here in junior high, you're not going to make it in high school. And if you don't do well in high school and do well on these exams, you're not going to make it to college. And if you don't do well in college, you're not going to get a good job. And like it just, and it started in kindergarten. So school is not a so a psychosocial moratorium so another word for psychosocial moratorium is escape right um and that's that's one of the features of games and to a lesser extent uh books and movies um uh my generation and yours uh our parents um uh, uh, criticized <laughs> <laughs> the notion of escape quite a bit. I think my generation and and yours uh, are a little more forgiving and understand the idea of and the value in escape. It turns out that escape uh, is, you know, when you talk about it, about going to a place where you're free from consequences and you can just be creative um, and try different things, uh, you, you learn better, right? We need that kind of space. Not every moment of our lives um, can be tied to uh, some long-term uh, do-or-die goal. So that's psychosocial moratorium. Provides escape, allows you to be playful, right? So those three things. Um, there's another one I'm thinking of. We'll, we'll come back to it if we if it turns out to be helpful. But those those concepts are important. Um, they're going to lead us, I think, to what the superpower of games is that I'm thinking of. Um, looking at my notes here. So, uh, let's see. I think these, those three things especially, um, because games provide those, psychosocial moratorium, projective identity, and embodied experience, that those things prime the player of games, especially certain kinds of games, for a very powerful uh, experience. So um, when we think about story specifically, we can deliver story through narrative in, in games, right? We have all these tools at our disposal, narrative, dialogue, cut scenes, in-game text that you read, you know, we can do all that stuff. Um, but since the player's primed for these embodied experiences, let's, let's do that. 
So how and what am I talking about? So a couple of examples. I'll give you one from Riven and I'll give you one from uh, another game. Um, in, in Riven, um, you're exploring the world. It's a, it's a, you know, it's alien to you. And um, you make your way through this seemingly abandoned village um, and you go into, you find yourself in a classroom. Uh, it's obviously a classroom. It, look, there's devices here for learning. There's things are kind of kid sized. Um, on the on one of the shelves is a thing you can play with, and it's a it's a toy, and it has symbols around the bottom, and it has a figure on this rope. And um, if I remember, I don't remember exactly how the mini game works, but you can play with this thing, and the uh, the figure. If you get it wrong, the figure falls and. Uh, a little toy um, creature comes out and eats it, right? So this figure is dangling. It's a little macabre, um, but kids' toys and fairy tales often are. And so, you know, you can imagine kids actually really enjoying this toy. And it teaches them counting. The symbols around the bottom are uh, the symbols in that language for numbers. So you, you as a player get to go into this classroom and play with this toy you learn the counting numbers and it's this weird you know it's this like i said kind of macabre scenario and then you're done in the classroom you walk back out and you realize what you're standing near or next to is the life-sized um replica of this toy or what this toy was a replica of there is a platform here and up at the top that you thought was just a crane or a hook or something is this whole device. And so now you know, you've learned how to count <laughs> in the language, but you've also discovered what the purpose of this, uh, this contraption outside in the heart of the village was. The other example that I love um, comes from the game Guild Wars, the first one. In Guild Wars, uh, this is an MMO. Uh, I don't remember the timing of this. Guild Wars 2 is out now. It's been out for a while, so this is a while ago. But um, in Guild Wars, you start out, and most of these MMOs, a lot of MMOs have sort of a starting area where you're just learning the game. Guild Wars had a, a zone, an area. You're playing, and you're running around. You're learning how to do combat, Um and you meet uh, a young girl, Gwen, and she, you know, she she's enamored with the idea that you're an adventurer. She also has a problem right now. She's uh, lost her flute, and uh, there are some uh, animals, some creatures down by the river where she thinks her flute is, um, and she can't go get it because it's too dangerous. Would you please help her? Um, most people agree, and they you learn how to fight uh, and beat these creatures but you also get the flute and then Gwen offers to follow you around she can play the flute and she can heal you right when she plays her flute so uh and I don't know how many people actually chose to have her follow around but so that was pretty much the extent of the interaction with Gwen um you might have had her join you and heal you for a little while but soon you out level that you finish the little story in that starting area and in Guild Wars the um there's then sort of a, a uh, there's an attack by another nation or a group of creatures and there's sort of this scorched earth um the, the zone you're in gets um really uh damaged um by these enemies and you kind of just watch this happen and then you're dumped into the the world that you'll spend the rest of your time in guild wars in so Fine, you're playing along, you're doing your thing now, after you know, you've learned how to play, you're past the bunny slope, so to speak, and you're you're getting new skills and abilities and you're doing all the random quests and little things that you do in an MMO and you uh you find a a hut, maybe, um, if you're exploring, and in the hut um that's been destroyed and burned, um, there are some, you know, broken furniture and things paintings have fallen and there's things on the ground and one of those things if you hover your mouse over it is a broken flute and 
it's named Gwen's flute. Uh, and that's it. That's the extent of your interaction with Gwen. Uh, it's a really powerful experience. Um, and so powerful that, uh, with, with that alone, you, and you never see Gwen again, <laughs> um, in Guild Wars, but she became such a fan favorite character that, uh, they built her into, uh, later episodes. Well, there might've been some DLCs where they reintroduce her in Guild Wars. I know she's a part of Guild Wars too. She's grown now and you can find her and she can join, join you, uh, as a party member, I believe, or a mercenary or something like that. Anyway, she's involved. So the, um, yeah, so that's that's my second example of embedded story. Those are my two favorites. Um, traditional mediums do this too. Uh, I'm thinking of like, so spoiler alert, the the half buried Statue of Liberty um, in the beach at the end of the original Planet of the Apes. Right, that's a classic example. Um, but when it happens in movies and books, it tends to provide a twist, right? Uh, or a reinforcement of things you're already thinking. Um, in games, it's a direct personal experience, right? Um, it's an embodied experience. And because we've been primed um, through uh, the other things that games are particularly good at in terms of teaching and conveying um, uh conveying worlds and conveying characters, uh, projective identity, psychosocial moratorium. We're especially primed for those embodied experiences in games. So, so that's cool. And a few games have done this well, um, with these momentary moments of embedded storytelling, but, uh, and, but I think we can do even better. So that is what I was thinking of in terms of the superpower of games in terms of storytelling. Um, but we can go further with games um, and move beyond just these momentary uh, embodied experiences that are super powerful and take games to another level. Like how do we go from games just being entertainment um, to a powerful, uh, uh, moving, uh, meaningful experience? How do we go from games uh, being entertainment to games being art. So that's what I want to talk about next. Um, let's see. Let's talk about the, let's talk about what keeps maybe games from going from entertainment to art, uh, first, and then we'll talk about maybe what can be done and how, how we get there. Um, I think the problem one of the problems is that, and maybe the primary problem, is that often the game itself, right, the quantization, the objectifying, the distillation into rules and procedures, that the action that you're doing as a player are often disconnected from the the other bits, what the other bits are trying to communicate, what the story's trying to communicate to you in, ter in a story sense, what the, what the B uh, story is, so to speak, or what the characters are going through or what you're experiencing in that projective identity as the character, right? Um, so, uh, and then <clears throat> what will happen is that other stuff, the story, the characters becomes just this wrapping on the more formal elements we would call of, of the game. So not all games have dramatic elements, right? So this is coming from um, the main text I use, hold on. The main text we use <coughs> in, uh, game design workshop class is this, um, Tracy Fullerton game design workshop. She, UC San Diego, maybe. USC School of Cinematic Arts, uh, director of the USC Games Program. Um, game, she was involved with games like um, Flow, uh, other ones that aren't coming to mind right now, um, but phenomenal designer. Anyway, um, she likes to uh, break game design down into uh, categorize the um, formal elements, things like things that every game has to have to be a game. 
rules, procedures, um, outcomes, right? You can win or lose, um, uh, things like that. Dramatic elements are those things that connect us emotionally uh, to a game. So characters, setting, uh, the name of the game, right? Um, uh, challenge, how how um, how challenging the game is. That's actually, all games have some level of challenge, but the key function of challenge is to engage you um, with the game. Other formal elements would be like conflict. Uh, and and now, now we're talking not so much about con the way we talk about conflict and story, but games have their own form of conflict in terms of like, it's much more sort of uh, objectified, right? So uh, I have my goal, I have my objective in the game, another formal element, to uh, score the most points in the game of American football. And so uh, the conflict there is what's keeping me from just taking the ball and moving it to the end zone? Well, the other team, they also <laughs> want to score points and they're going to try to stop you. So there's some sort of uh, mechanical conflict, right, if you will. Anyway, so that's the idea of formal elements and dramatic elements. To be a game, it's got to have all these formal elements. So like tic-tac-toe is a game almost zero dramatic elements, right? Nothing really hooks you emotionally to tic-tac-toe. Um, and not all games need it. Checkers, right? Also, not a lot of dramatic elements going on there. It's just game rules and procedures and objectives, some conflict, and have at it, right? Um, other games. Uh, so let's say we make a, uh, a Barbie version of checkers, and we just put... We're going to put, you know, we've got one, instead of red and black pieces, we've got um, Barbie pieces and Ken pieces. Okay, we've got Barbie checkers, right? Um, maybe we even have a little, you, when you buy Barbie checkers, you get a little story uh, in it of Barbie and Ken playing checkers, right? And something unfolds in the story, right? It's cool. We've got Barbie checkers. You'll probably sell a lot of Barbie checkers. Um, but... Uh, there's not a lot go <laughs> going on there in the webbing, right? Connecting uh, those dramatic elements to what you're doing in, in the game. And so um, that, I think, is where we can take games from entertainment. And games that become art or we start to think about art have done, uh, have done a lot of work or a lot of effort or really tried to um, pay attention to that webbing. What the story elements, what the dramatic elements are trying to convey, convey and how that's meshing with the, uh, the mechanical, the game elements, right? And so, as an example, um, and I feel comfortable talking about Myst in this way, because I, I didn't work on the original Myst. Um, Myst is now in the Smithsonian, so I think it's valid to consider it a work of art. And let me just do a little bit of analysis here of what's going on with Mist and why it's valid to consider it a work of art rather than just entertainment. And it has to do with that webbing. Okay, your game task, I know a lot of you may not be familiar with Mist, so uh, you'll have to just indulge me here. And if I can find some images and stuff, I'll, I'll try to layer them in here. But, uh, the original mist, your game task is to piece together the story of what's happened in a strange abandoned world. To that end, your task is literally collecting pages from a book and assembling the whole. The music is mysterious and lonely that emphasizes the sense of loss engendered by this unfinished story. The spaces are fantastic and beautiful in contrast to their isolation, which further drives uh, drives you to complete the story that's been fragmented and broken. Ironically, uh, completely assembling the pages is the losing condition. To win, you have to figure out that the story isn't over, that it continues in you the player, and when you realize that, it's a reflection of the brief narrative you get uh, at the very beginning, where the the author who lost this original book and disseminated these pages 
um, actually you discover is hoping for uh, or is thinking along the same lines that um, yeah so uh, that I think is um, the webbing there how all the pieces fit together the attention to detail and all those dramatic elements and the way they mesh with what you're actually doing mechanically in the game um, make for this cohesive integrous whole um, so, yeah, that's why I think um, Mist wound up in the Smithsonian. So, um, I hope that was helpful. Uh, I think I have a list of questions um, that uh, some of you submitted. I'm going to see how long this recording has gone, uh, see if we have some time left, and I'll pick some of those, and let's look at those. First question, during your time... During your time developing the game, what made the studio want to go with a more common sense puzzle rather than brain teasing challenges? Do you think it paid off to make it easier than harder? So uh, the context, um, so the other adventure games of the time, right, um, of that era, the puzzles, what the, what the person asking here calls common sense, there weren't <laughs> They're pretty arbitrary. Uh, these um, uh, missed siblings, so to speak. Uh, an example is uh, one of the Zork, and this is one of the later Zork games. These were text-based adventures, but um, in Zork, there's the there's this creature, the Gru, who lives in the dark. And if you go into dark places without a light, um, you'll get eaten by the Gru. That kind of happens all through the Zork adventures. Well, in one of the Zork adventures, you, you, you're stuck in this area, you don't have a light, and the only way out is through this tunnel. And um, it, the, it turns out the solution to, to get through this tunnel is to, there is a cow, and you, have some, you find some carrots. You can feed carrots to the cow, and then milk the cow, and then drink the milk, and then you can see in the dark, and then you can go through the tunnel without getting eaten by the Gru. Now, um, if you're not sensing all kinds of trouble uh, with that puzzle, um, I'm, I'm probably not going to have a lot I can tell you. But that's the context that um, that Mist uh, grew up in. So, um, in contrast, the missed puzzles can generally be um, reasoned about, right? And they're consistent with their world building. Um, so you can figure things out. Uh, I think that's what the, what the person, what the asker means by common sense puzzle. So yeah, and I think that actually paid off in spades <laughs> because um, maybe you like those kinds of contrived arbitrary puzzles. Um, where you really have to think, I guess that's thinking outside the box. Um, but uh, people seemed to enjoy <laughs> the ability to uh, to reason through things. Um, now, with that said, it's interesting to know that with the number of copies that Mist sold, the majority of people never got off that first island. So um, uh, don't be surprised when you make your games, even if it's a best-selling game that most people don't play it in its entirety or even a large portion of it um i uh, there's another question here i saw let's see uh mist features uh intricate puzzle solving gameplay how did you design these puzzles within the game engine and what state steps did you take to ensure that they're fair for a player uh, these two uh questions in tandem <laughs> kind of tickled me because one one is identifying, okay, the puzzles were more common sense and you made them easier rather than harder. The other person is identifying, oh, there's intricate puzzles. How did you keep them fair? Um, that's just, I, I brought that up. So the short answer to the how did you keep them fair question is find your target audience, have them play test the game, have them try it and watch what they do and how long it takes, what solutions they try. Uh, Maybe they need more clues placed here and there, that sort of thing. That's the actual answer to the question. But I also, uh, these two questions uh, paired together tickled me because, you know, your challenge um, is a dramatic 
element of games and it's subjective and you'll find people no matter where you dial your your difficulty in some people will think it's too easy some people will think it's too hard some people will be frustrated some people will be bored and this what you all you can really do there is identify your target audience have them test the game and see if they're experiencing what you are hoping for them to experience that's uh that's it um let's see how did you come about being on the development team on cyan were you a big fan of the first game before pursuing the position yes um so when i got married my wife had an apple II, uh apple 2 si apple mac si uh, and we bought a cd-rom drive <laughs> And what do you do with it? I used one from a friend, and what are you going to do with it? Well, there's this popular game out called Myst. Um, and so we bought that. We promised to play it together. And that is, Myst is what opened my eyes to the ability to, uh, for a game to tell a story. Um, and so I set down the road. I thought I was going to have to, I never dreamed I would work at Cyan on the Myst series, but. I got a, I was working as a research programmer at Carnegie Mellon and I started taking classes at night at the Art Institute of Pittsburgh and I thought well I'll make my own games I'll, you know go it wasn't even called indie <laughs> at that time this is the mid to late 90s right um but these guys were accessible on uh forums this is before this is before Google, this is before YouTube, this is before anything you're familiar with. Um, but there are these online bulletin boards, right? And you could basically post messages. And um, so I sent, I got in contact with one guy uh, and he introduced me to one of the other artists and I sent him some of the stuff I was doing and it was good enough and they found out, um, but that alone wouldn't have, wouldn't have um, piqued their interest, I don't think. But then they found out I could also uh, code. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I was, I was decent at all these things. And um, it was the combination of talents. So that's another lesson. Uh, there's two ways to make it in the game industry. One is to be the best at some specialty. <laughs> the other is to be, uh, be decent, be good at a number of, a combination of things. Um, and so, yeah, that's, uh, that was, a, uh, thanks for that question. Um, let's see, what were some hardware limitations you encountered and how did you overcome work around them? <clears throat> um, there's an interesting story of Rand Miller, actually, who made who, the founder of Cyan, he and his brother, I believe... Uh, I might get this wrong, but I believe when they were making Myst, CD-ROM, you know, CDs were new technology. Uh, and so Rand actually wrote, uh, and Myst was so big. Um, the images were large. Um, they needed to meet certain load time standards um, or just for both hardware and just publisher standards. And so Rand wound up writing his own CD-ROM driver, I believe, so that it would... Uh, so that it would burn the tracks in the most optimal order for mist on the cd drive so um what you see when you play mist today might feel like a pretty simple uh pretty simple engine a pretty simple mechanic uh but there was some there was some pretty amazing um technology going on behind the scenes to make that happen at that time so uh, that was another reason I think um, that propelled Mist into the the sales that it got was um, that was unique. Um, what was your favorite age from the series? And I think for the sake of time, this might be. Yeah, what was your favorite age from the series? So um, I don't think a lot of people would pick this one. There's an age called Selenetic, uh, and you. Um, First of all, you get there via a rocket ship, which is just super cool. Uh, but there's a lot of sound puzzles on Selenetic. And it's not, it, it's, it was aesthetically beautiful, right? But um, in a different sort of way. Not the kind of space a lot of people would just choose to spend a lot of time at. Um, 
The reason it's my favorite, uh, so people had a gameplay gameplay issues with it. Lots of sound puzzles that people um, enjoyed. Other types of puzzles more, uh, and and a different kind of aesthetic. So anyway, Selenetic was the first age I worked on in that first week that I joined Cyan, and so that will always just have a uh, um, uh, that feels like home. So. With that, I hope that all of this was helpful or interesting in some way. Uh, my office is in Building 61 in the SSGA lab. If you uh, have an interest in the video game industry or want to know any more, feel free to shoot me an email or uh, come on over and visit sometime. I have office hours posted on my door if you don't find me for some reason. So uh, again, thanks for having me. Okay, well, I was processing this video. I couldn't stop thinking about another question in the list that I was sent, and it had to do with uh, what can someone who wants to be involved with story and games do to get better? And so, for warning, I am kind of terrible at actionable advice. A friend once asked me what was the one thing he should do right now to be like a, like a better person. And I basically told him to go study ancient Greek and Hebrew for four years. So with that in mind, here's a thought. I, I talked in this video about embodied experiences and embedded story. So, uh, those things are easier to provide in games, but, all, but they're possible in traditional storytelling. I'm thinking of um, something that's attributed to Ernest Hemingway. It's six words. Here it is. Uh, listen, listen to this. Imagine you are reading it. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. If you don't feel something, then I <laughs> advise you to focus on something other than story in your career. For the rest of you, that's embedded story in a traditional medium. That's embodied experience in a traditional medium. So. You can practice that. Write some flash fiction. I wrote two pieces of flash fiction each week for a year in preparation uh, for writing my second novel. Out of a hundred or so pieces, there were maybe a dozen that I liked, and a couple, like two, that connected with other people. Out of over a hundred. So that's my advice. Write some flash fiction. Write one a day or a few a week. Keep doing it post them somewhere that people can read them and see what people respond to and keep going that's all thanks for watching and listening have a great rest of your day